world's turned upside down. It's Palm Sunday, 2020, and we're in the midst of the COVID-19 virus, and so many people are staying in their homes as they should, practicing social distancing, as they call it, and uh, we are having our services online. We record our messages every week uh, for everyone to listen to and view. But this week is special since everyone will be uh, having that same experience. This is a tough time for so many people and it's a tough time for churches in general. We will get through this. God has never left us. God is beside us. God is working for us. God has his plan and his fulfillment in his time. And we will be grateful for all that he does for us and the way he cares for us. We praise Jesus Christ on this Palm Sunday. We praise God for all that he does. You know that I love each and every one of you, and if I can do anything to help you through this time, please let me know. Let's start this morning by going to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Gracious, magnificent Heavenly Father, you know our hearts, our minds, our souls, you know our fears. Address them, Father. Bring us close and whisper in our ears. Tell us how much you love us and how much you care for us. Wrap your arms around us and hold us close, since we can't hold each other close at this time. Teach us patience. Teach us love and forbearance. Grace us with attitudes of praise. Help us to go out into this world when we can and take the love and, and, and grace and mercy of Jesus Christ with us as we do that. Bless us as we enter this holy season, Father, and experience a, a whole new way of worship. We know you have not forsaken us, Father. We know that your plan is perfect. So please speak into our lives and show us how we can be of service to you during this time. And Father, we ask you to embrace those people that are our first line of defense against this virus and all of the first responders as well and their families and all that they do and all they experience and all that they put forth because father they're on the front lines they're out there exposing themselves to this virus and they're doing it for us so father i ask you to bless their lives keep them safe hold them close let them know that we are praying for them and, take, and doing everything we can to care for them father be with those that have the virus at this point. Bless them. Give them strength. Provide them with healing. Be with our churches as we learn new ways of doing things, Father. Help us to bring together our congregations in community and unity in ways that we haven't thought of in the past. Help us to realize that just because we're apart, does not mean we're apart. We're still part of the same community. We are still loving each and every one of ourselves together and bringing ourselves together. So Father, give us the strength to help each other and lift each other during these times. Let us look for opportunities to reach out into our community when we can and also into our own fellowship and lift those here, Father. Guide us, teach us, hold us close, Father. Be with all our ministers across the region and across the world. 
as they also struggle with helping their congregations through this time. Use this time to your glory, Father, and teach us and encourage us. Guide us to new depths. And Father, help us to remember that this time is of the year is when we experience our holy season, the season when we celebrate the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us not forget what this season is about. Thank you, Father, for all that you do for us. Thank you for your love. Thank you for this congregation. And thank you for the ability to bring this message to that congregation digitally across the internet. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. As I said, it's Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday, a day that we all celebrate together. Usually we have children that walk down the aisles with palm branches. And, and we do have lilies this year, which I am so grateful for those who provide those. We can fellowship together through this interface. We can join in worship, and that's what we will do now. The message this morning is, how can I be silent? And our passage today comes from Luke 19, 37 through 40. And when it came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. God bless the reading of his word. A thousand years before the birth of Christ, David was commanding Saul's armies and doing an excellent job of keeping the Philistines in check. God continuously blessed David as he fought battle after battle in the name of Saul, the nation of Israel, and God himself. And Saul sought to promote David, giving him more and more responsibility. He also wanted to give David, uh, keep David in the battlefield because David had become extremely popular with the people. It was to Saul's political advantage to keep David away from Jerusalem and out of the people's immediate sight. But every once in a while, David and his armies were allowed to return, if ever so brief a time. We read of one such occurrence in 1 Samuel 18, 5 through 9. Whatever mission Saul sent him on, David was so successful that Saul gave him the high rank in the army. And this pleased all the troops and Saul's officers as well. And when the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs and with timbrels and lyres. And as they danced, they sang, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. And Saul was very angry. This refrain displeased him greatly. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. What can he get, more can he get but the kingdom? And from that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. You know, it's a funny thing how many leaders will support and encourage their young followers and supporters. That is until that time when those 
followers and supporters start gaining followers and supporters of their own. That has a tendency to make the current leaders not only a little envious, but also a little frightened that they might be able to, not be able to hold on to their control. We need to acknowledge the fact that David never stopped supporting Saul. He had the opportunity to kill him and seize power for himself on several occasions. And in 1 Samuel 24, 10, after David refuses to kill Saul in the cave, he shouts out to Saul, I will not lay my hand on my Lord because he is the Lord's anointed. David understands who he is and what his place is. And he understands that his duty is to serve God's anointed king. Trying to force God's hand by seizing power is never the way to go about leadership. And God's timing is everything. And when we force God's hand, it does not bode well for us in the end. David never called for the people to rise, raise him up. Ever. God's blessings and God's timing did that. And when the people were dancing with joy at the victories that God had provided his people through his servant David, it is that joy that cannot be silenced, that, that encourages the people to shout, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. It is no wonder that Saul is discouraged. It is no wonder that Saul is envious. It is no wonder that Saul is angry. It is no wonder that Saul is frightened. Saul sees what is happening through the earthly eyes, through his own earthly eyes, instead of seeking heavenly insight. And he feels that his authority is slipping from his grasp. But, but there's the rub. You see, David is praising God for his successes and Saul totally forgets that his own authority comes from God and not himself. The human nature of his jealousy will ultimately be his downfall. I want to take a minute and move forward a little bit in time to another event that is historical but not biblical in nature because it is important for us to understand it. It sets the stage for what is to come. You know, 49 years before Christ is born, an event occurred that would change the path of history. And in a way, it affected the land of Israel because it changed the political climate into which the Christ child was going to be born. The Roman Republic had greatly extended its boundaries through the efforts of an up-and-coming military commander by the name of Gaius Julius Caesar. Caesar was the first Roman general to cross both the English Channel and the Rhine River, and by doing so, he had conquered Britain and all of the surrounding territories. Caesar had gained quite a bit of notoriety through those accomplishments. His men loved him. The people loved him. The Roman Senate, the guiding force of the Roman Republic, was led by the first triumvirate, and the first triumvirate consisted of three men in balanced positions which made it all work. And these men were Caesar, Crassus, and Pompey. And when Caesar became so very popular, Crassus and Pompey weren't very happy as they saw their authority slipping away. Just like Saul struggled with when David gained such notoriety, Crassus and Pompey didn't get set out to kill Caesar at that time. But they did attempt to pull the plug on his growing popularity by relieving him of his command and ordering him to come back to Rome. At the time, it was illegal for a Roman general to approach the gates of Rome with their army. It was something that just wasn't done. And just like it is illegal to deploy U.S. military forces within the boundaries of the United States, especially in Washington, D.C., there were rules that applied to Caesar. But Caesar, wanting to solidify his popularity with the people, gathered one legion of his army and did the unthinkable thing. He crossed the Rubicon River and headed straight for Rome. 
And his catchphrase when he did this deed was, Alea Aacta S, which translates as, the die is cast. And when we say this today, we are meaning that there is no turning back, that we have reached the point of commitment. We are past the point of no return. And when Caesar crossed the Rubicon and entered Rome, the crowds were overjoyed and ecstatic. And before you could blink, Caesar was declared dictator for life by the people and then by the Senate who feared the people. This was Caesar's civil war, which changed the way the Roman Republic was structured and the new Roman Empire emerged. And yes, Julius Caesar managed to upset a number of people with his grab for power. It is no wonder that Crassus and Pompey were intimidated. They, along with other Senate leaders, which included Caesar's best friend Brutus, decided that the best way to head off these governmental changes was to cut off the head of the beast by killing Caesar. And they learned the hard way that making a martyr of a figurehead like Caesar doesn't usually solve the problem, but instead it often solidifies the changes that have already started being made. There are several reasons I tell you this story. The first of which is that in this time of governmental transformation that Jesus is born, these events created conditions for a perfect storm with regards to the birth of the Messiah, our Lord Jesus Christ. God's timing is always perfect, and God knew that the reign of Caesar Augustus, the imposition of the tax audit, the rise of Pontius Pilate as governor of Judea, the appointment of Herod Antipas as king of Judea, and the rise of Joseph ben Caiaphas as leader of the Sanhedrin, not to mention the intolerance of any suspected insurrection, would all come together to create the perfect atmosphere that would culminate in the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and allow the spreading of his story and his message throughout the world. Again, God's timing was absolutely perfect. Now, the second reason I bring up the story of Julius Caesar is with regards to the parallels that we find when we examine how the people rejoice at Caesar's entry into Rome and Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. The crowds in both cases are ecstatic. And just when David enters Jerusalem a thousand years before, in truth, there is no containing the joy and the celebratory nature of the people in any of these events. But you have to be asking yourself why we're talking about all that. What does this have to do with our message on Palm Sunday and how does this relate to how can I be silent and our anticipation of Easter Sunday next week? Jesus, just like David and just like Caesar, had reached the peak of his popularity. He has healed so very many people. He has brought so many lessons with stories and these lessons have been direct in direct contradiction to the teachings of both the Sadducees and the Pharisees, who were the religious leaders of the time. And those religious leaders, led by Caiaphas, held great authority over the people. And Jesus had to had become a threat to that authority, while at the same time becoming a hero to the people. Jesus personified what it meant to be a servant leader by taking his message to the people, eating with the people, sleeping with the people, praying with the people, and spreading a doctrine of love and acceptance everywhere he went. He was reaching out to a people desperate to find the, 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 the Messiah that was going to lead them out of bondage and out of Roman entrapment, which only saw the Israelites as vermin, animals to be exploited. Jesus restored their dignity. 
Let them know that God had not forgotten them and loved them beyond measure. He gave them worth at a time when the world sought only to crush them. So yes, as far as the Sanhedrin and the Roman government were concerned, this Jesus was a rabble-rouser, a misfit, a religious zealot, a threat to the very core of their society, and he needed to be removed. And just like Crassus and Pompey and Brutus and the Roman Senate decided the best way to solve the problem of Julius Caesar was to eliminate him, so the Sanhedrin sought to eliminate Jesus. And that they had bothered to truly study the prophecies rather than outright rejecting them because of their own fear, they might possibly have seen that they were not in control of the situation, but that God was fulfilling his promises to his people. At the time of our passage today, plans are being formulated, alliances are being sought, Bribes are being paid, lies are being told, and lines are being drawn in the sand in order to solve the Jesus problem. And by eliminating Jesus, they thought that the problem would go away. They had not learned that lesson from Julius Caesar's death. They had not learned that lesson by listening to what God had to say. God's plans are perfect. God's timing is perfect. But Jesus and his disciples are just outside of Jerusalem. And Jesus tells his disciples that there's a donkey down the road and they are to go retrieve it for him. And if anybody stops them and asks them about it, they are to tell them that it is for their master. And they get the donkey and they bring it to Jesus and they put their cloaks in, on the donkey's back and Jesus mounts the donkey. Then he proceeds down the road as great throngs of people lay their cloaks and palm branches on the road in front of him. They are shouting to the heavens and so excited by his coming. Shouts of Hosanna and blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The noise is absolutely deafening. This is akin to a ticker tape parade in Times Square. The people are ready to put a crown on the head of Jesus Christ and make him king, much to Herod's chagrin. And I'm sure that there were some people who might have possibly remembered the story of how Julius Caesar had entered Rome and been offered the crown of the Roman Empire three times before he accepted. It is important that we understand that Jesus did not promote himself to this place of honor any more than David had. Just as David was raised up by God as a, festival, a vessel to his king and to his nation, so God is raising Jesus up through his ministry, miracles, teachings, and actions. The people are responding to this ministry as proof that Jesus is fulfilling prophecy. That everything is coming together as the prophets said it would happen. It is happening as it was foretold. They are looking to Jesus for their salvation. This was the people acknowledging that they believed that Jesus was the Messiah. The king that would rescue them from the clutches and the stranglehold of the Roman Empire. The excitement of this triumphal entry into Jerusalem had not been seen since the days of David. So when the Pharisees cannot take it anymore, when the noise is so deafening that they can't handle it, when they see what is going on with all these people, they cry out, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he replies, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. In other words, this can't be shut down. 
This is meant to be. This is prophesied. You can gag everyone here and the very stone on the ground will shout out that Jesus is king. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Nothing you do or say can change that. And let's face it. The Sanhedrin cannot allow the people to make Jesus king. They would lose power. They would lose authority. They would lose status. They would have to take a back seat. And they were absolutely happy. Jesus. Jesus had to go. The Jesus problem had to be solved. And so begins a week of plotting, planning, bribing, and threatening in order to find the chink in the armor of this son of a carpenter from Galilee, this Nazarene, this itinerant preacher who seems to have powers to heal the sick and raise the dead, that claim to be able to forgive sins, that ignored the laws of the Sabbath, that associated with common criminals and people wallowing in their own moral failures who is now being heralded as the Messiah, the long-awaited Savior of Israel. This was not possible and could not and would not be allowed. But I want to take a minute. Just, just take a minute, close your eyes. Put yourself in that crowd that day. Everyone around you is just teeming with excitement and screaming and shouting at the top of their lungs, Hosanna! And then you see him. This, this, this man from Galilee, this Nazarene, riding on the back of a donkey. You've heard so many stories about him. The people are throwing their cloaks on the ground in front of the donkey. They're putting down palm leaves and waving palm leaves. This Messiah that we have waited for for all of our lives is here. This king that has been foretold for centuries has come. This leader who will rescue us from our lives of misery at the hands of the Romans. How can we be silent? How can we be silent? Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But Jesus didn't come just to save that crowd of people. And he didn't come just to save those who followed him through his three years of ministry. He didn't come to save just Israel. That triumph of March is all about Jesus, the Messiah, who came to save each and every one of us. It would be easier for us to believe if, if we had been on the side of the road that day and we had seen that excitement, if we had seen those people as they were shouting and crying out, it would make it easier to believe when everyone else around us believed. And seeing the Son of God passing down the road on the back of that donkey must have been a truly awesome experience. You know, it's easy to scream and shout when everyone else is screaming and shouting. But the question is, the question is, can we find that same sense of awe and wonder and shout praises to God even when we are the only ones doing the shouting? Is Jesus any less of a Messiah when we are alone? Are we convinced that he died on that cross to save each and every one of us? Would he have done it if we were the only ones who believed? Would Jesus really leave the 99 to save the one, even if that one is us? If that is true, and I believe it is true, then I have to ask again, how 
can we be silent? If you truly believe that Jesus is the author of your salvation, if he has saved you from your sins, if he has brought you to the foot of God so that you have a place in the presence of God through him, how can you be silent? If you truly believe, ask yourself that question. How can I be silent? If we don't cry out, the very stones around us are going to shout praises to our Lord Jesus Christ. Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, you sent your Son. Jesus died on the cross for each and every one of our sins. Jesus absorbed our sins on the cross. He defeated death for us just so that we could have a relationship with you, Father. Let us not ignore that. Let us think about that day when Jesus entered Jerusalem riding on the back of a donkey where even the stones would have cried out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Thank you for the gift of your Son. Thank you for our salvation. Thank you for your love. We ask your grace and mercy upon us throughout this holy season and throughout this crisis that we are dealing with. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior.